Alrighty, so today we're gonna take a look at how our models inside our model or monolith are gonna communicate with each other. My name is Vasily Alenik and you're watching the .NET architecture series where we are building a notification system based on industry's best practices. So essentially in any kind of system we're gonna have one of the two types of communication or both at the same time, synchronous and asynchronous communication. And while we are all familiar with synchronous communication from all the plethora of tutorials for beginners and for everyone that's that are on the internet, some of us might not have worked previously with async communication. Both types of communication come with advantages and disadvantages. So the main advantages of synchronous communication is, in my opinion, first of all, everyone is familiar with how it works, so it's really predictable. Uh, essentially, it's really easy to use. It offers you a lot of speed, so the in-memory calls, gRPC stuff, it's really fast. However, it comes with a couple of drawbacks, essentially the biggest one being coupling and dependencies. You can abstract away that coupling so you don't depend on certain implementations, which is really a good thing. However, if one of the components or one of the models is, let's say, unavailable, the rest might be affected. Async communication, on the other hand, kind of solves that issue. Since your models no longer need to know about each other, they uh, communicate via messages, which results in a higher availability and loose coupling, let's say so. However, you're introducing a couple of other drawbacks, so it's a double-edged sword. You're introducing complexity, which when we get to the topic of exception handling in asynchronous systems, it's an entire Pandora's box over there. And one more, you're basically introducing the message broker, which is another failure point that when goes down, your communication across models is essentially non-existent. With each system, you need to value really what are your priorities in that given moment. For example, in our notification system, we have asynchronous communication and synchronous communication alike. I would usually strive and go for the easier one, which is synchronous communication for as long as I can and introduce asynchronous only whenever necessary. So back to our notification system. In the previous video, we've discussed a little bit of how the request is gonna flow. So the source application itself is gonna make an HTTP call to our push service, which essentially will send a message to an events queue. This event queue is gonna have a couple of consumers which are gonna be the mobile notification service and the webhook service. These two are gonna listen on events that come in into this queue and respectively trigger their own flows. So the mobile notification service would send a push notification via APNS or Firebase to other mobile applications and the webhook service would basically retrieve available webhooks from the repository and reach the data and send the event forwards to another integration queue where we're gonna have a webhooks processor which will listen to those events and send the payload back to the client applications who are interested in this set event. Now, the message broker that we decided to go with is RabbitMQ and essentially you're gonna have to work with exchanges. In RapidMQ exchange, an exchange is basically a core component that is responsible for forwarding the message from producer to the consumer. So in RapidMQ we have four types of exchanges, direct, topic, funout, and header. Most of them work with a term known as routing key, which essentially is just a string one that you might see over here, or I've given here an example. I'll zoom in a little bit over here, so we can get a better view on the routing key. In our case, a direct routing key might be something like events.microsoft.hdreportal, where events is, I decided to start off all my topics or routing keys with events since we're treating events. Uh, then comes the code for tenant, and then the name of the application. So basically we might have a listener that listens to this exact routing key. So all messages that are gonna be pushed using this routing key will get to that queue and there will have one or more listeners to that specific queue. Now, the second type of exchange is the topic one, which we are gonna be using inside our system. 
In our case, we can enhance the simple routing key by adding wildcards. In our case, we might have something like this, events.microsoft.star, where the star is basically any kind of application over here. So if we are interested in events that come from a specific tenant across all of his applications, we're gonna use a topic exchange with a format like this. We might, for example, be interested in all events that happen in an application for all tenants if we are building a multi-tenant application or more than one multi-tenant application essentially. So we might have events.star or wildcard.azure portal. Uh, for now, the exchange, everyone gets a share. So all the queues that are bound to that specific exchange are gonna get the message that comes into the fun out exchange. Uh, by the way, on topic exchange, we might have a hashtag uh, up front and that would work like the fun out exchange. The last one is the header exchange. It's really similar to the topic. However, instead of the routing keys, it's using the header values. Over here, we have a glimpse of the routing keys and the topics themselves that we are gonna have. So we have the events.tenancode.app code. So this is the routing key that the push service is gonna use, where we're gonna introduce the code of the tenant and the code of the application for which the event has come in. Then the webhook service is gonna listen for on this exact topic, on this exact routing key. However, it's gonna have a couple of wildcards over here since we're interested in all events across all tenants. And then it's gonna forward the webhook via the events.tenantcode app code webhooks, which is the routing key for the webhooks processor. Essentially, the notification system is gonna behave in a similar way once we implement it there. Now, let's take a look at our code base and see what we have there. So in here, what I have added since my previous video is a Docker Compose file, which at the moment contains the RabbitMQ with the management plugin, as well as a Redis container, a Mongo database and a SQL database. We're not gonna use this three at the moment. We're just gonna use the RabbitMQ. So this is the basic setup for how we want to run our Docker instance. Next, we should go over to our utilities and over here I have messaging, I have the RabbitMQ folder where we see a couple of interfaces and a couple of classes. The most important to us right now is the iListener interface. So basically this is the interface that we are gonna use for our event handlers. Over here we have a simple method, sorry, a simple method to process a message and the routing key definition. Next one, the iMessage sender, which is going to be a singleton across all our system. So basically we have a single method to publish a specific message. The message itself is a custom class, which is a wrapper that we're going to use. Essentially it has a header and the body. And inside the header we have a couple of properties, which we are going to pass to the RabbitMQ header. Now I'm going to close all this and go over to the routing keys. Over here, we have the routing keys defined that you have seen on the previous diagram. In REST, it's basic stuff. So we have some header constants for our header values. We have a message sender, which essentially just creates a message and publishes it to a channel. We have the receiver together with the worker service. So the receiver itself is gonna receive a list of listening services, which are basically implementations of the iListener and is gonna configure those for processing the messages. And we're gonna run it via worker service in the background. Last but not least is the RabbitMQ installer where we are setting up a RabbitMQ. We're adding our Rabbit. MQ receiver, we're adding our singleton for iMessage sender, and we're setting up everything, including the model factory for managing our channel connections. What's interesting to us lies inside the services folder, which we have over here. So as mentioned in the previous video, we don't have anything added over to our program.js. Everything goes inside the implementations 
of the models. So we have our push service where for now we have added an endpoint definition and inside the routing we have the push service endpoint which works on this specific path and basically creates a new message with an application code, app code and the tenant code some tenant which are then added to the header of the message and the body of the message itself is an event received payload. Uh, by the way this event received payload by the way this event received payload lies inside our utilities messaging integration events and over here we have an event received which basically has only a payload string inside the body and then we have the webhooks received event which is the next part so back to our push service endpoint we are basically creating the message creating the routing key that we need and yeah i have a type over here since we needed to have this and the tenant code should be this one probably it was a copy paste of mine from somewhere now once the message is published over here it's picked up by an event handler inside our webhooks which we have over here so the event received listener inherits from i listener interface adds a value to the routing key and basically waits for messages to come in then we are basically deserializing the body of the message to an event received checking out all the webhooks that we have for this specific event uh, for now it's a mocked webhook event and then for each of those available webhooks we're basically creating another event which in our case is a webhooks event received where we have the payload from our incoming message and then we have an available endpoint that we have defined inside our repository and we place it back onto the topic exchange with another routing key now we go round and round so basically the event processor is gonna pick up this received event handler and as you might have seen right now i've removed the program.cs from event processors since i wanted for now to be just a dotnet library a bit later down the road i decided to transform it into a console application so for now over here we have another listener that listens on this specific message messages and for now console log that we have received an event and sent to the client let's debug and see it in action so once i hit debug over here we have a request over here so we're basically just going over creating a message creating a routing queue publishing the message to the exchange then our event listener picks up on that specific message and handles it further where basically we are retrieving data then creating a new event message and publishing it over to our topic so inside our console application we can see a couple of log statements over here that i've added for clarity and if we move to our rabbitmq management so guest guest and if i go to notification exchange we can see two bindings one is for the events webhook service the other one is for the processor itself and over here i think we can go over to the queues as, as well and see their messages so over here we have some message rate essentially it's a panel for managing our red queue so yeah that's basically the general idea of how we want to handle async communication inside our system so in the future whenever we add one more model for example for emailing or for desktop notification etc it's gonna wait on this one specific queue or sorry for this one specific routing key and we're basically just adding it without changing existing code so we're extending our system really nicely another possibility for you might be for example to start and to have some event processors for specific tenants or for specific applications behave differently for example in the past we've had some tenants that were using azure ad so for them we were generating the access token differently for others we were using for example an api key so we used a similar approach just for us to navigate and to route our messages across all the code that all the plumbing code that i've went over is inside the description itself so you can go and check it out 
If you like this kind of content and would like to see more, please like, share, subscribe to the channel itself. It helps me a lot. As well as tell your friends or someone, just give it a glance. I really appreciate any kind of opinion over here in under the messages since architecture is a really vast topic with a lot of opinions and a lot of different practices. Until the next video comes out, I'll put a link over here or over here for another video that might be really interesting to you. See you next time.